Um, okay, so we are continuing our series, our summer series in Acts, and uh, it's been great so far. Uh, I think we've heard some really, really neat things. I've been challenged on a lot of different levels, uh, not just kind of where I am currently in my walk with God, but even looking back on on just uh, kind of taking the sermons that we've heard and, and using that as a, an overlay on my, my history as a disciple and thinking through again just what it means to, uh, to be filled with the Spirit and to live a life that, uh, that is really guided by and driven by the, the lessons that come from this amazing book. Uh, so we're gonna we've kind of made it up uh, through the the ninth chapter. Uh, Matt got most of the way through the ninth chapter uh, last week, and this is coming out of Saul's conversion. Uh, Matt talked a little bit about that, and um, and he made a statement last week that really stood out to me, and I, I wanted to just highlight it and repeat it as I was looking through my notes over his sermon this week, uh, thinking about my sermon. He made this statement that we do not ascend to truth. Truth and true life descended to us, or descended to humanity in Jesus. Just this really powerful thought of, of who we are and, uh, and who Jesus is and who he was and, and the power of his life. And if we're not spending some time each week reflecting on that, we're missing a huge opportunity to really be changed and transformed. And so, I feel like we can get, I know certainly for myself, I, I get to places sometimes where I feel like, okay, I know the, the nuts and bolts of the Bible, right? I know the story. Um, I've, I've spent a, a majority of my adult life uh, really trying to understand and grow in my understanding of the scriptures and, and what Jesus' life means for me. Um, but I'm always struck at how every time I sincerely go back to that, I'm just richly challenged and blessed in that. And so I just want to put that out as an encouragement for you as you, as you think about uh, what it means to be human, what it means to be a disciple. And as you put those layers on top of themselves, you should be challenged. You should go back again and again to the Scriptures and try and understand who God is and who He's calling you to be. There's tremendous power in that for us. Um, to, to really try and be shaped and molded more and more into the image of God, into uh, the life of Christ. And I just don't think you can overstate the significance of what happened with Saul of Tarsus and, and the conversion that happened there. And, and think just for a second about just about the transformative power of God's grace and how it was on full display in this conversion that we in this conversion that we see in Saul the transformative power of God's grace and i just i wonder it immediately makes me think of of that power at work in my own life you know initially certainly as i heard the gospel message and i came to a decision to to make Jesus lord of my life but then the ongoing power of God's grace and how it is the single best tool that we have to take our lives from where they are in this broken state to be transformed into something that uh, reflects the goodness and love of our Heavenly Father. And it made me kind of think and wonder, who are the Saul's in my life? You know, who are the people that, uh, that seem like they just have it completely wrong? And, and who maybe even I rule out as a candidate for the kingdom, right? Because I think we naturally do that, and we're going to talk more about that. These preconceived notions that we have, these prejudices we have towards people and situations that in our mind rule them out as somebody that God can save. And it's, it's a little embarrassing to even say that out loud to say that I've thought that about people. I was praying for a jam camp uh, a couple of days ago and just thinking through like, you know, 
the number of kids that go to that and, and how God moves and works and, and will all those kids grow to, to love God and, and serve Him and, and just wrestling with that with the spirit of, of this idea that, that ultimately that's God's deal. That I have this responsibility as a disciple to carry the message, but ultimately God is, is very capable of, of bringing people to where they need. And even if I mess that up in that process, that he can make that right and bring people into the kingdom. And so again, I just would challenge you to just think for a second. Let the Spirit speak to you for a second of who the Sauls are in your life. You know, maybe it's somebody at work, you know, a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor, a family member. You know, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for us. And so the point I want you to take away, you can go to the next slide. Uh, the point I want you to take away from our talk today and our time in, in Acts chapter 10 is that the gospel is simple but powerful. And it is our responsibility as Jesus followers to deliver it without prejudice or preconceived notions. So you could make that like seven points, but you know I'm on this like kick of, of just having one point, so I packed it all into one sentence. But it's just this idea, and we're going to see it in this story today with Peter and Cornelius as we, uh, as we talk through and think about um, uh, what Peter does here, what Cornelius does, and, and what ends up happening. So uh, we're going to do a little teaching, we're going to do a little preaching, and then we'll wrap up. So uh, just jump with me over to, to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 1 through 33. Uh, I'm in the ESV. If you want to uh, switch that around in your, your app to, to follow along exactly, you can. We also have it up here on the screen. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all, of, with, with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who, who attended him. And having, re, having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the, and the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was tape, taken up once again to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. 
So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been uh, kind enough to come. Now therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. And so I want to hit pause here real quick before we go in to the next city and just talk through a little bit about what we're seeing here. So uh, there was this Roman centurion uh, named Cornelius. Uh, this is uh, an important distinction because as we see in the text, it was a big deal for Peter to have any association with this guy. Um, the idea that, uh, that God would send uh, Peter and therefore the Holy Spirit into this place was, was just unthinkable uh, for Peter. And, and so this guy represents everything that, that Jewish people in, gen, in general would hate about the Roman occupation. And so this angel appears to him and tells him to call for a man uh, named Peter. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here is that uh, this was a, a Roman centurion, but somebody who seemed to be a fairly religious man, right? We read a couple of things. It states that. Um, it says that, you know, he was very generous. It said that he gave alms to the poor um, and that he was a God-fearing man. And so it's interesting, again, here for me to think about this and say, well, why did Peter need to go and talk to him? Why did Peter need to go see him? And we'll see again here in just a second about what Peter's mission was and, and how he ended up bringing uh, the gospel uh, to this guy. So Peter comes and he finds Cornelius, and Cornelius had invited his friends and family. Did y'all uh, catch that? And all these people are sitting here in his home and again, this kind of scandalous moment happens when Peter, a Jew, enters into this non-Jewish home because that just didn't happen so that they would avoid any kind of ritual impurities and kind of the subsequent tasks that needed to happen in order to cleanse themselves of that. So then we jump back for a second and recall Peter's vision. It's this strange vision of this sheet with all these different animals that were deemed unclean and not to be eaten, descending from heaven, and the voice from heaven saying, you know, arise, kill, and eat. And Peter's like, no way I'm touching that. No way I'm touching that. You know, that goes against everything that I've known, everything that I've loved, everything that I've learned, everything that I've seen modeled in my life since my life started. And then before that, going back hundreds of years in our religion. Okay, so think about that for a second. You know, this is a bigger deal than it might seem on the, on the surface. That you have to get down underneath this to try and understand what God is doing here. There is a major shift going on in the Jewish religion at this time. A major shift. One that seems unthinkable and unbelievable. And we're going to see in Peter's response in just a second um, how he still seems to be wrestling with it. But the point that God is saying here in his response, he says, Don't call impure what I have made pure. And Peter is this Israelite, you know, wanting to um, adhere to all the different customs was basically saying, no way, but the vision was not about the food. It wasn't about the laws. It was about something bigger that God was doing. The vision was preparing him for the moment of him standing among impure non-Israelites. And so just as mind-blowing as it was for Peter to try and eat from the things that were on this, on this cloth, it was just as equally crazy for him to go into a non-Jewish home and then do what he's about to do here in just a second. And so again, there's some applications here for us. There's some things for us to think through. Um, you know, what are our preconceived notions of the people who are around us? What are the things that we look at, the different situations in our life that we look at and think, you know, God would want us to have nothing to do with that? Even after hundreds of years of our religion being a certain way, is there some shift that God is calling us to? I don't know. We have to ask that question though, right? 
We have to think through those things. What are the, the things that are unclean in our lives now that God may be calling us to something different? Don't say it's never happened. We have an example right here in front of us of God coming into a religion that had been set for, at this point, around 1,500 years. Rituals that were deeper down to the core DNA of who these people were. And he says, now we're going to change. Now we're going to shift directions. And so again, the point here for me in this to try and bring to your attention is we have to be on the lookout for those things. We have to be willing to see the visions that God gives us and to respond to those, to be willing to step into those areas that we definitely might feel uncomfortable, that we definitely might be looking at and saying, there's no way, right? Because God may be saying, no, 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 there is a way. And I I know the implications of, of this. I know the challenges behind this. Again, but I'm trying to put myself in Peter's place and say, What do we do? How do we respond to this? How do we respond? And so there's these tough questions that the Scripture immediately kind of kicks us in the face with. And he did the same thing in the Scripture with Saul, the story of Saul, and people thinking there's there's no way. And so just be very careful (laughs) when you think that thought, there's no way. Because there might be a way. And as, as Jesus followers, as Christians who love Jehovah God, we have to be willing to, to look into our lives and our times and say, what is that for us? Okay, so then that's your teaching. Let me get into some preaching here. Let's talk about uh, Acts chapter 10. I want to read this with you. Uh, verses 34 through 43. So Peter opened his mouth. Okay, so here's his response, right? He walks into this household. His mind is blown by even being there, this vision that he had saw. Everything that was once, you know, one way is now shifting some, and he's trying to say and figure out, you know, what's his response? What's the message? So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. So just in that, I mean, just, I'm going to go back and I want to read this again. Listen to the, the, you can just see his mind processing, right? Everything that's unfolding in front of him, he's definitely off balance here. Right And leaning on the Spirit. Again, he says, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. As for the word that He sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witness of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead." To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. I timed this yesterday. I read through it a couple times and timed it. Anybody want to guess how long it took me to, to, share, to read that section? What? 90 seconds? Okay. Two minutes. Around five minutes. Okay. It took me... One minute, nine seconds, 69 seconds to read that. And I was just struck with the the simplicity of that message and the power that went behind it. That if he stands before this household and he brings this gospel message, that is the gospel. 
Did you notice what he did there? He shared the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He was that messenger that Isaiah 52 talks about that comes with this good message of God reigning and God saving and God loving that in just over a minute, he shared a message that would change this family's lives, that would change generations of their descendants. In just over a minute. Now, was there more said there? Maybe. This is what we have recorded. But again, the fact remains for us. And so I just want to break this down a little bit and think about what each one of these scriptures is saying and how easy it is for us to share the same thing. Notice first that Peter didn't say no for this guy. I just think about how many times I've said no for people. Oh, well, surely they wouldn't want to, blah, blah, blah. Or it'd be awkward if I blah, blah, blah. You know, and I say people's no for them. I have a guy that, that works for me that lives in Knoxville, and we try and bring him in three or four times a year to meet with uh, customers. And on his last trip, de- trip in, he's super fired up, loves God. His last trip in, he jumped in the car, and I said, hey, how was your flight? He was like, great, I got to share the gospel with the guy sitting next to me. And immediately my mind starts churning w- with... <laughs> Just all these things of like, well, what about relationship? Who's going to follow up with him? And I, I mean, just I start explaining away everything that, that happened in that moment. Shame on me for that. The power of the message, you need roughly a minute to share that and then to let the Holy Spirit move and work in a way that brings people into a relationship. Now, are those other parts of, of bringing people along, making and maturing disciples important? Absolutely. I'm not taking away from that. But there's something powerful in what we see here in this example, that these words are powerful, the, the, the implication of the things that are said here means something. There was no relationship. He was very direct you know, and it was pretty impressive that the centurion was willing to listen to this. And that, again, he had brought all these people with him, like, hey, this guy's coming. I want you to hear what he has to say. And I just wonder how many times we squelch that, how many times we put the damper on that and keep that from happening. Again, God can work it out in another way. Praise God. He can do anything he wants to do there. But I think we just miss a lot of opportunities. So let's look at that first scripture. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right uh, is acceptable to him. So this is just God's desire on display for all to be saved, for all people to be saved. That the message applies to anyone. You can put that slide. uh, Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, but yeah, this is, this is this message here. And just think of the power of this statement. We talked a little bit about this a second ago. Think about the power of this statement in the people's lives who are around you. And then let's kind of zoom in a little bit back to just ourselves and make it a little bit more personal about the power it has had in your life to change that that's one of the most powerful things that we have, the power, most powerful tools we have to try and share the gospel with other people is what happened in our lives. You can hear when people are changed and moved by the power of Jesus. And again, there was this significant shift here around hundreds of years at this point where Jesus had planted the idea of Gentiles being saved, but then you see Peter going here in this, really this first example of him going into uh, and preaching this to somebody and saying that anyone can be saved. Anyone? Anyone can be saved. Like a Muslim anyone can be saved? Anyone can be saved. Like a murderer? Anyone? Anyone can be saved. Like like a pedophile, anyone? Anyone can be saved. The gospel message is for all of God's people, all of His creation. And again, the takeaway for me in this, and I want to challenge you with it, is don't draw lines around who God is reaching. Don't draw your lines around them. Don't draw your preconceived notions and prejudices and preconceptions and all those different things. Don't you draw your lines around what God's doing there. 
Because the gospel message is for everyone. And he says, and they have to believe this message. So that next scripture, Jesus was sent by God and equipped by him with the Spirit, it says in 36. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism, and John proclaimed how, good, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So these people had heard this. They knew about Jesus. They knew about what had happened. And, and he breaks it down to them and just says, like, God equipped him with the Spirit and sent him to do miraculous things. And I think often we make this mistake of thinking in terms of, like, an angry God who had to be pacified for something that a, a gentle Jesus did. But the early preachers never preached that. To them, the very coming of Jesus was due to the love of God. And we see that in Christ, there's this amazing thing that God is doing in reconciling His people, making a way for all people, everyone, to have a relationship with Him. And it's just been so powerful for me to, to in studies with people through the years, is to go back and read through Jesus' miracles and for people's mind to kind of be blown you know, and try and have to sort through like the, the physical kind of side of that and ramifications of some of Jesus' miracles. But it's equally as powerful to talk about this upside-down approach to life that Jesus brought. And everything that they thought he intended to do, he flipped it upside down. You know, rising to power, the greatest becoming the most powerful – Jesus said, no, the least are the most powerful. The poorest among you are the, in the best spot. And you could just see their minds being blown throughout that whole process and how that's still relevant today. It still happens today when you talk through people who are wrapped up in the, the crap of the world. And you speak into that and you say, there has to be something different. There is something different. There's this guy named Jesus. Let me tell you about his way of life. And how he values the least among us. You know, how he builds up through love, um, you know, those who the world rejects. How many people feel that way? Feel this sense that they're not worthy. That they, they couldn't ever possibly deserve love like that. Well, surely if you knew what I had done, there's no way that God could love me. You guys have heard those stories. You've seen that. And just think the message that we bring into those people's lives when we say, no, you can be loved. And there's a way for you to be right with God. And it's just powerful to think of, of, of that message that we get to speak into people's lives. The next scripture there, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. You know, Jesus exercised a ministry of healing. It's this point that we can bring to people. Um, it was his desire to banish pain and sorrow from the world. People need to hear that. People need to hear that this world that we're living in is not the way that God intended it to be. And that on top of that, that he's making things new. Every once in a while, I just start thinking about how messed up the world is, and that's not getting any better. That thought keeps coming to my mind. And then I hear Brianna saying in my mind, the world is getting better. You know, God is restoring it. He's making it new. And I'm this battle between like, Brianna, I don't know what she's talking about, but look at this over here. I'm like, no, like that's from the scripture. So it's got to be right, you know. But we're wrestling with that and talking through that, you know, with the spirit to try and figure out. But that's the message that people need to hear. And I think this is where you get to really brag about your Lord. In this message, in this gospel conversation that you're ha having, think of all the stories you get to share of how he interacted with people. What's your favorite Jesus story right now? Why? So she said, Jesus with the leper, and how, I almost said leopard, that would have been weird, <laughs> but how, you know, how somebody who hadn't felt physical contact needed to feel that. 
You think there's anyone today that needs to hear that? Absolutely. What, what's another one? What's your favorite Jesus story right now? Because I'm saying right now because it could change. But what's your favorite one right now? Raising Lazarus. Why? Yeah. 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 He said, and I'm repeating this in case somebody's watching online, but he said Lazarus because of the compassion that he shows and, and just the, the heart behind all that. Think anyone needs to hear that these days? Okay, a couple more. Zacchaeus, why? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That story is rich with lessons. He mentioned Zacchaeus and and how Jesus is turning to and touching him and inviting him uh, really changed his life. Again, people need to hear that. Anybody else want to share it before we move on? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. He said Nicodemus because of, uh, you know, just the, the challenge it is to the way we think and, and um, all that. So, you know, it's just, it's powerful. People need to hear these stories that you have. We could go through. I hope we could go through and everybody could share. That would be my, my hope. And if, and if you couldn't share in that moment, get into the Word. Get back in. Go read through the Gospels. Go read through the Scripture and find those things. Be ready to share those things. Because sometimes it's those stories that really put people in a place to receive the Gospel. Yeah, brag about God in those moments. Um, next point, they crucified Him. It just says in the Scripture, they put Him to death by hanging Him on a tree. This is an important part of the Gospel. This is... Um, you know, when you, when you kind of read between the lines here, you can see kind of the horror of the crucifixion. And again, Cornelius, being a Roman, would understand what was going on there. He would understand that, that the cross was an uh, instrument of execution, that that was a, a modern-day electric chair, if you will. And it's a, a statement about what human sin can do. And this is kind of the low point. You know, like when you're watching a movie... Um, and you're working through a story of some kind, you kind of have these different parts of, the, of the, the message, the different parts of the story. I feel like this is that low point, you know, where we, we think, oh, gosh, this is, this is the worst part. It's got to get better from here. And it does. But we can step into that with people. We can embrace that, what had to happen, and explain why he had to die. You know, that that's part of this story, that they crucified him. And we bring this then message of hope. Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. This was written like 700 years before Christ's life. And listen to what Isaiah says in his prophecy. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And just think of the power of that to bring into people's lives. And we get into this next part in verse 40 and 41. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. That here we have it. You know, that the power of God is over everything, even death. The power of God was not going to be defeated. It could conquer the worst that men could do, and in the end, it could ultimately conquer death. And so you start building back here in this moment of the story, you know, that Jesus' life, you know, was restored, that, that he was raised from the dead. 
And then it brings us to this next point in 42, that we're witnesses to that resurrection. And he commanded us to preach to the, God, uh, to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. It's, it's such good news. Jesus is not some figure in a book that we just read about or that we've heard about. He is a living presence whom we have personally met, whom we personally know. We're not just telling him about some guy. This is our guy. You know you know when you talk to parents sometimes about their kids and they're just like flowing and flowing about them and just how great they are and you, you know all that. I mean, this is our opportunity to do that same thing with people, to teach them about our guy. We are witnesses. Each of us are personally witnesses to his existence. And I mentioned this a second ago, but I want to touch on it again because I think it's really powerful in Isaiah 52, um, where, where Jerusalem had just fallen to Babylon and most of, of the nation had been taken into captivity. But there were some people left behind, and they were certainly kind of trembling in fear and frustration, thinking about being abandoned by God. You know, just thinking about God not being there, and everything in that moment seemed lost. And the poem goes on and says that there was this watchman on the city walls who spots a messenger running to them in the distance and he's shouting, Yeshua, Yeshua. And he's running to them as as quickly as he can. And Isaiah says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. Your God reigns. The feet were beautiful because of the message that they were carrying. This message of hope and salvation that God will return and that He'll take up His throne and He will bring peace. People need to hear that today. Everyone needs to hear that. That simple gospel message that is just so powerful. And we announce a new messenger, Jesus, announcing and coming in God's reign and building God's kingdom. And again, not the way that people expect it, in a very different way. It's just so amazing to watch people's minds kind of start clicking when they see the power of the gospel message. And so the result of all this was ultimately the forgiveness of sins and a new relationship with God. And verse 43 says, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So we get to tell people, through Jesus, the friendship which should have always existed between man and God, but which sin interrupted, is now available to everyone. You know, in a minute, in a minute, we can take that message and change people's lives. And so if you pick up in 44, we'll just work through uh, these sections, not reading them directly, but just kind of talking a little bit about what happens. So it says, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. And while Peter, Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And we see the, the, the salvation of, of him and his household. And the Holy Spirit being poured out, and they're called to be baptized. So just one quick little note here. Um, It's interesting in the New Testament, there's not one conversion that happens where baptism isn't immediately a part of it. And and so I believe there's something more going on there than just an, an external profession of faith. I believe that God is doing something in baptism that um, that is is significant. So I just thought I'd point that out for you to kind of chew on and think through too, um, about you know where you stand on on some of that and the importance of baptism. And then starting in verse 11, we see how the the church responds, uh, and then this goes all the way through uh, verse 18 of of chapter 11. And the thing I'll just point out about this that's really powerful is like the church is freaking out. The church is like, you went to whose house? You did what with them? Wait, what happened? I mean, you got to think. Like, it's crazy. It'd be mind-blowing to them. But I love, if you want to pick it up in, in verse 18. So Peter explains. He goes back through what we read in 10. And he comes uh, to verse 18. And it says, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And it's kind of this moment of tension of like, are they going to? accept this? Are they going to reject this? And I love then it just says, 
And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. You know, that they got it. That they understood. And again, remember, these people were in the same place that Peter was. Lots of tradition and long-running beliefs and practices that in a moment, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they were you know, converted and changed in their mind to, to be okay with something that seemed probably just a day before to be unthinkable. So there's real power in what we're reading and what we're studying. And I hope you guys are, are taking some time kind of throughout the week to think through those things. Praise team, if you guys want to come on back up. But, or, or wait, are we doing communion next or song next? Okay. But yeah, just, um, but just thinking through these things and trying to dig in on them. I hadn't thought through the whole animal sheet thing in a long time. And so just being back in the Word and studying that and understanding and seeing the huge shift here, this was really powerful for me to just think through and, and try and process you know, what all these different things mean and what the ramifications are for us in our lives today. So I hope that was uh, challenging to you. And again, just a reminder to you of, of the power of the gospel. And again, just how simple that is, um, but how powerful that is. And I remember... Uh, kind of going through uh, as a young minister, talking through things with Ronnie one time and, and just worrying a bit that I didn't know enough. And his response was something along the lines of, John, you have enough information right now to save the entire world. And, and just kind of thinking about that a lot through the years and, and how we tend to think that knowledge is, is going to you know, take us to some better place. And it can, right? It's, it's, it's worth, I mean, there's some, some value in that. But in terms of just the gospel, again, a, a one minute, a little over one minute talk from, from Peter lined out the whole gospel. And that message is probably in your hearts as well. You know, is all the, the breakdown and the exegesis on all those different scriptures you know, stacked up in your mind? Maybe not, but that's okay. We can let God handle that. I mean, you have the message that can save the entire world right now. And so again, my challenge to you out of this is is that you'd be using that, that you'd be looking for opportunities, whether it's sitting next to a guy on a plane or talking to a coworker, visiting with a neighbor, um, you know, looking for those opportunities to share the gospel message with people and not drawing lines around Who's qualified for that? Because God says all are qualified, right? Let's say a prayer. Uh, God, help us. Uh, we want to do this right. Um, there's this weird balance and tension for us between, um, you know, the knowledge of it and the um, uh, just the the fear that's in that. Um, but we know we can see in this that that really ultimately the gospel message is is this simple thing that carries with it so much power. And so give us boldness, uh, boldness like Cornelius had uh, to be open to something different, um, boldness like Peter had to, to answer the, the Spirit's call, and that ultimately through that, that the kingdom can be advanced through us. Uh, I pray that we're not just hearers of the word, uh, but that we really are doers of the word that go out and and uh, seek to understand more and love more and uh, forgive more and extend your grace to the people around us. So uh, we love and lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen.